catastrophic cosmic disturbances and such. So what I thought I would do to set the tone for the evening was to get a scene from one of those movies. So this, this will really connect. It really will connect <coughs> with what we're doing tonight. will come and he will 
uh, rid the world. He will conquer the Antichrist and he will bring in, he will fulfill all these passages in the Old Testament about a reign of righteousness on this earth from Jerusalem. So it's there in Christianity. It's there in Islam. The day of judgment. It's the, uh, the preceded by the appearance of the Mahdi. And he comes, the Mahdi, or the Messiah, that's their Messiah. He comes mounted on a white stallion. Interesting. But uh, Muhammad borrowed, you know, right. picked and chose and borrowed. Right. I always had a running joke with the, you know, the Billy Earl, you know, that one of these days he and I were going to get our own religion. We're going to start our own religion. Mm -hmm. it, had, you know, it has to do with, you know, things like eating barbecue and things like that. <laughs> but it comes with Isa. You know, Mahadev comes with Isa. And Isa is his uh, right hand man. And that's Jesus, if you didn't know that. And uh, they are going to come to, dis uh, to destroy the. Uh, the um, the Mazi Adaji, the false messiah. There's that, they're antichrist, okay? So it mirrors a lot uh, of, uh, of what is in Judaism and in the Bible and in Christianity. In the Bible, the day of the Lord usually identifies uh, events that take place at the end of this age, at the end of, of human history, closely associated is another phrase called and in that day. you got to understand, Yom is the Hebrew word for day. And uh, even in Genesis 1, Yom can even means part of a day. And when, when he says he, Jesus called the, you know, the, the, the sun and the moon and the, the daylight he called it day and the evening he called night. So day talks about 12 hours. And Jesus even references that in the Gospel. So the day, uh, the day of the Lord, it's not a 24 hour day, it can mean a 24 hour day, but also mean an age or an indefinite period of time. So the day of the Lord identifies that period of time, that day. And the day of the Lord refers to a span of time during which, in which God personally intervenes in history, directly or indirectly, to accomplish some specific aspect of His plan. It's not that God, and I, I went to, we, we, this morning we talked from Psalm 33, that God is sovereign. God is, God even now. I mean, let's look at the books of Daniel. And I said, there, especially in Daniel, you see God setting up kingdoms and bringing down kingdoms. And, and, and so He's still involved in that now. But what we're talking about is a very undeniable way that God steps back into human history, intervening. You're doing the book of Acts, and it's front-loaded with, uh, you know, of course, in the Gospels, Jesus performed miracles. Do you believe in miracles? You can't believe in the God of the Bible. You can't believe in the Bible, and I believe in miracles. And Jesus performed miracles, authenticating who he was and what he said. And he empowered his apostles to do the same. And if you look at the book of Acts, you see a big day, de crescendo, you know, when it comes to these kind of miracles because as, as uh, the church was established and, and reached, you know, you have uh, Acts 1 8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other most parts of the world, the Word of God uh, being given us, the written Word of God. Uh, you see that those, those miracles, de crescendo, and so we've had this long period of time where, you know, people are kind of asleep. But I'll tell you what, there's a wake-up time coming. I had a few days ago in my daily Bible reading, and right now I'm ahead. I'm, I'm in Isaiah. And as I, this, this, uh, this year, as I'm reading through Isaiah, as I, I said, well, I want to purposely look for two things in Isaiah. I want to purposely look for you know, sections of scripture in Isaiah that talk about this, the day of the Lord. And I also want to look for those passages of scripture that talks about the millennial kingdom, you know, that thousand year reign of Christ. We'll get to that in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. And, and, and so as I, this has been a week or so ago, and I was in Isaiah chapter 13. And I want to go through that. I, I thought, I'm going to read that when I get to, when I get back to Revelation because it's so powerful. I, I, it, what it really shows here, 
God, this one book, isn't it? And, and so it, though it's consistent. It's going to be consistent with where we're going to end up in Revelation chapter 8. If you hang on, we'll be there. But we'll drop the needle here. You just saw the apocalypse, that movie. Uh, what was that? Uh, the, what was that movie I just... You may know. Beach Impact. What now? Beach Impact. Yeah, Impact. Uh, you saw some of the things there. I want you to look at this. Isaiah chapter 6, verse... Uh, 13 verse 6. Are you there? What's the word? What's, what's the first word? Oh, yeah. how? Uh, that's not a pleasant sound. Uh, uh, lamenting, it's, it's horror. <coughs> now look at this. How for the day of the Lord is it? It shall come as a what? Destruction from the Almighty. Well, what's going to be the oh, I'll tell you what. Therefore shall all hands be faint. Every man's heart shall melt. They shall be afraid. Uh, for pains and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a man having not passed in a kidney stone. <laughs> Why is it the Bible? It's always birth, childbirth. Bless your hearts, ladies. And then some of you have to have the kidney stones as well. Travail. There was a woman that travails giving birth. They shall, be, uh, they shall be amazed at one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, here we go again, the day of the Lord cometh all cruel, but with what? Wrath, Wrath and what? Fierce anger. Fierce anger. Now, concerning terra firma, to lay the land what? Desolate. He shall also destroy who? Sinners thereof. Out there. And so this, God is going to have the last word. I, I'm thinking of Jude. When he says all those ungodly things that have been said against all those proud voices that speak against God. Well, boy, I think God's going to show up and put them, and they'll be silent. So he says to put sin. Verse on that. Let's lift the earth. Let's go to the cosmos. Let's go to outer space. Verse uh, 10. For the what? Keep, make a note. Make a note. For the stars of heaven and the what? Constellations shall not give their light. And the sun. Look at this. Shall be dark. And is going forth. And the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So this Isaiah through God is describing this age of not just you know desolation on this earth, but loosing the heavens, so to speak. Verse eleven: I will punish the world for their evil, their with the wicked for their iniquity. You know it says in um, it says in uh, Ecclesiastes, I think. That, you know, because the judgment of God is delayed, they think it's never coming. Because God is merciful in His judgment. He's long-suffering. Aren't you glad God's long-suffering? None of us would be alive here tonight if we were not long-suffering. But because God is so gracious and gives us time, we think it's not coming. You know, I, I will cause, look at verse 11, I will cause the arrogance of the pride to what? Cease. The haughtiness of the terrible. I mean, this is why God hates more than anything to cry. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than a golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will, okay, you got to pay attention here. I will, look at the words. What's the word? Shake. Shake. Shake the heavens and what? The earth shall remove out of her place. And the wrath of the Lord of hosts should be the day of end. You know, we're having we're having earthquakes. Who would ever thought we had earthquakes in North Central Texas? And in Oklahoma and and uh, the great fault lines. And you know, it, the world is saying that we've all thought and maybe hoped that our California would fall off. You know? <laughs> but you know, they, they're talking about uh, up, up and down the West Coast, but not just there. There's, there's fault lines in this world that, uh, that 
that are well, 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 hundreds of years overdue. God's word makes it all clear that God has set aside a time of punishment for a rebellious world, a world gone wild. Interesting. Beginning with the loosing of the seventh seal, the book of Revelation reveals the specific steps of punishment that God will bring upon mankind as a part of the prophesied way back, the prophesied day of the Lord. Okay? The book of the Revelation, and that's where we find ourselves. Let's back up. Chapter 1. Verse 19, it divides the book into three sections, just like Acts chapter 1 divides, and verse 8 divides Acts. In Revelation, you know, it says in Revelation 119, write the things which thou hast, hast seen, the things which what? Are, and the things that shall be what? Hereafter. Revelation chapter 1, we encountered John as he was exiled by the medium. We think the emperor of the medium of the Isle of Patmos. And, and why? Well, because he was faithful to the Word of God. He was faithful to the testimony of Jesus Christ. I mean, bad governments, there's nothing new about that. Right. Nothing new. I really, you know, first century Christianity prospered you know, under, you know, under the Romans. And John records the things that he saw. Here's the first division of the book. Chapter 1. And what does it contain? Oh, my goodness. This wonderful vision of the resurrected, glorified Christ. And the wonderful thing that, that blesses my heart is that he's standing in the midst of his churches. Amen. So we have that division. In chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, John records instructions and warnings and admonition to this present church age. You're going to place yourself somewhere in this book in the time frame. That's where we are right now. We looked at all of those seven letters. And you know, all of those seven letters have a message. All seven to every church today. Every church. We considered those letters. We, we went to Asia, which then, it was really not talking about the continent of Asia, but a province in Rome, uh, which is, is really Turkey. Okay, so we have the new division. And it breaks again in chapter 4. And we were in verses 1 and 2 of Revelation chapter 4. And he, 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 he goes there to this third, the period of the future. Yet in our future. He saw this door open in heaven. He heard a voice, not a trumpet, but like a trumpet. And, and what does he say to John? He says, you know, there it is. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Some say, well, that's the day of the Lord. But I don't think it is. I think the day of the Lord is, is coming later. I think it's the Lord's day. And he would not, you know, they can exile you uh, from his people, from in Ephesus or wherever. But I'll tell you what, God showed up on the Isle of Patmos. And I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. And then the trumpet, the heavens open. And the voice of the trumpet says, What? Come up. Come up. I'll show you. Notice, the things which shall be, what's the word? Hereafter, we go back to verse 19 of chapter 1. This is that third segment. And if we stop and put all of that that's contained in these first two verses, a transition here in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. We put all that together, we get what in the Greek is called the hapatza. Okay? And most conservative Bible teachers believe that they believe the hapatza uh, begins right here. It's spoken of right here. In uh, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to it's very, very significant because, because, because that means a pre pre -rap rapture. Are y'all with me? Yeah. And some people believe in a mid rap mid tribulation rapture. Some believe we'll just do a big U turn. But that's big. If that's it, then we believe that this harpazo, the English words, uh, rap and rapture comes from the Latin. You know, you know, our our King James Bible relied heavily, you know, on the Vulgate and, and the translations. 
So you got to understand that. And so uh, we, we like to put things in boxes, but <laughs> the boxes aren't what you think they are sometimes. The, the Latin raptomir or rap, raptio, and we get our word rapture, which is really not a word in the Bible. Well, missionary is not a word in the Bible, but it, it, but it means it comes from the harpazo, the Greek there. It means to carry off, it means to snatch out, to seize someone or something. So the English term rapture, harpazo, is known as the catching out of the church. We have a wonderful little mini sermon. You should come to choir practice and hear Josh preach. But, you know, he was talking about, and when we do, you go back to the Jewish wedding, you know, and the groom would leave and go to his father's house to prepare a room. Huh? <coughs> Meanwhile, he could, she made herself ready. You know, you know. <laughs> but Monday morning, you know, you can see him at the intersections. <laughs> Josh pointed out it takes the groom that much he's ready. But sometimes the wedding's late because the bride's not. She's getting herself ready because he, the groom, could come. Up. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, here we go, up. I will come again and receive talk to me. Well, this is not the second coming. That's in chapter 19 where he does. He didn't catch us up. He comes down. And receive you unto myself. Catching the bride away. And so we, we really believe in Revelation chapter 4. The rest of the chapter 2 through 7 is a heavenly city. We have the throne room of heaven in, in the remainder part of Revelation chapter 4. Uh, there's a sovereign with great authority. The world... The atheists, they don't want a God. And they don't want a God on the throne. Because they'll have to be accountable. Sure. Yeah. Well, you, you cannot go to heaven and avoid the throne. Amen. It's the sinful picture of chapter 4. And it doesn't even talk specifically about the, the uh, divine being sitting on the throne. But it gives attention to his radiance. It gives attention to his glory. And so, why well, I tell you what, when those angels showed up there, you know, with the resurrection or, or the announced, announced, you know, you know the, the glories of those just the creatures that surround the throne. There's this glory radiating from the throne. And, and, and an emerald green uh, in a bow encircles the throne as a sign of grace. As some say, well, you know, we project on this, but this is the mercy of God. This is the, uh, the grace of God in the midst of judgment. Even in judgment, uh, God's judgment, there's mercy. You know, God they gave David a choice, you know. You don't judge your neighbors, punish you and give you a whipping, you want me to. And David said, you do it, God, because I know you're merciful. God. Around the throne of God, there's 24 thrones. You know, there's just one throne in the middle, but 24 thrones occupied by 24. See, they call them elders. And uh, we, we, we project on that, uh, that, that the 12 and 12, we've got 12 tribes of Israel, we've got 12 apostles. You even see that on the holy city, it descends out of heaven with the foundations and the walls of gates. Uh, it speaks of the redeemed people of all ages. I think, I think if we're represented anywhere in this heavenly scene, in the throne room, and by the way, are you saved tonight? Amen. Put yourself there. Because in chapter 3 we're here, but the church here is not here anymore. The church in chapters 2 and 3 is not on the earth anymore after chapter 4. Amen. Are y'all with me? Amen. The church represented in chapters 2 and 3 is no longer on the earth after chapter 4. It's called God. Picture yourself here. Can I have an amen? amen. 24 speaks of um, the redeemed of all ages. In chapter 5, we're still in the throne room, but the focus changes. Jesus focuses on the seven sealed scroll. It's in the right hand of the one occupying the throne. The cry goes out. What? Who's worthy? It's a seven sealed scroll. 
It's called a book in, the, in, 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 uh, in our Bibles, the English Bibles. But there, there were, uh, Codex had not yet. It, it talks about a scroll. Seven seals. Who's, uh, who's worthy to open the seals? To loose the seals? Oh, there's a search. All of heaven, all of earth. It talks about under the earth. No one was found worthy. And it's then, but what a great moment that will be. Get excited right here. I mean, pop the popcorn. This is better than the Super Bowl. Jesus described as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Six seals are open. And it ushers in what is known. Oh, we took some time here, but we've got to connect the Bible. Because this connects us with Daniel chapter 9. The weeks of Daniel. Recorded there. Actually, chapter 6 through chapter 19 is the fleshing out. It's the detailing of what we call the tribulation period. And it, it, uh, it's, it's subdivided, right? into two segments in Daniel, chapter 27, by covenant. Come on. Yeah. And uh, it seems to begin with the initiation, at least in Daniel, of a covenant with the, with the prince of the people, which we believe is the Antichrist. And it culminates, it culminates with the second coming of Christ. Okay? Bookings of the seventh week of Daniel. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we took some time, we're not going to again, but there in Daniel, it details what God is to accomplish in that last week of Daniel. And it has everything to do with Israel. Because the church, that is in chapters 2 and 3, is no longer on the earth right. after chapter 4. Are you all with me? This is all about a Israel and bringing them to a place of repentance. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But to those who, and praise God, largely, the church history has shown those are Gentiles. First horseman comes. So here we go. When you go to Daniel, you see that this seventh week of Daniel begins with a covenant, but we don't see the covenant. We see a division in this week, and later on, but we don't see a covenant. But we see it. So where do we put that? We're going to put the rapture, the catching out, in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let me have you say You got it? You can help me. Get through this if you'll, if you'll agree with me. Amen. <laughs> we see the covenant in the white horse. The, the first rider on a white horse. The Mahdi. Right? Islam. Yeah. The Mahdi. You know? It's the animal. And so he, he comes. We feel like that, that that is when he brings in this age of, of uh, pseudo-peace, right? This age of pseudo-peace. And then it goes bad real quick. It's the second and the third and the fourth horseman. I tell you what, political year, a lot of promises. Hmm? I have to admit that our president now said he was going to change it. That a lot of things. Well, he has fulfilled that. The dream of peace that is promised by that rider of the apocalypse on the white horse soon turns into a nightmare. Never changed. Nothing ever changes. That moves us to chapter 7. We come to the first interlude between the sixth and the seventh seals. We talk about the hepatic. Uh, Heptad means seven, the static structure of the book of Revelations. And just, I challenge you to try to find all the sevens here in this book. But here we see the grace of God in chapter 7, in the midst of judgment. In the midst of judgment, we can see it, we can see it coming. The Antichrist reveals himself, it gets bad quick, there's persecution by the end of that, those uh, sixth seal, 
uh, the, those that are believers on this earth. And then, this is an amazing thing, because in the midst of this horrible, horrific uh, week of years, as it were, God's going to be saving people. God is going to use these 144,000 seals on their foreheads, and I think protecting them. He's going to use them in a ministry upon this earth in a very powerful way. And at the end, it's a very moving scene, because at the end of that chapter, we see a great multitude, representing every nation, kindred, who have washed their garments white in the blood of the and, and, and I think this is the harvest of these 144,000 saved seal Jewish evangelists from the face of the earth. And that moves us to chapter 8. And so the seventh seal, after they first interlude, the seventh seal is loose. But we're somewhat astonished and surprised by what follows seven special angels standing before the throne of God and are given seven trumpets. There's a 30-minute period of silence. Oh my goodness, have you ever tried to just stay quiet three minutes? And we see that prayers are offered up as incense in silence. And this is so full of imagery of the tabernacle. We've got to understand the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament Reveal. You can't, well, I just, I'm just a New Testament person. You can't even understand your New Testament if you don't know your Old Testament. Amen. It's good to read the Bible through every year. I think we should do that. What do you think? And so it's as if, it's as if all of heaven is holding their breath. Those trumpets are about to sound, and they have an idea of what, of what is about to break loose. And then, oh, that's, that, that uh, scepter that filled with incense is cast in the earth. And we have a foreboding of what's going to come with these trumpets. The seven trumpet judgments are divided into two groups. It seems like that's, that's the pattern. And in this case, we have four and three. And so these three, the first four, Revelation 7 through 13, that's where we're going to get eventually. And then the remainder three are, you know, more detailed and uh, there's more said about them in chapter 9. But we're going to break it here. So many Bible students believe that, uh, well, the number four, it's interesting. The number four, they believe, is the number of creation, the number of the earth. And uh, it speaks of God's creative works. This morning we talked about uh, God's fiat, his mighty power, uh, creating uh, the heavens and the earth. And, and so God culminates his material creation uh, by the fourth day of Genesis 1. They, four divisions are given in man, of mankind right here in Revelation chapter 9. He says there's nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. There's four points to encompass, four seasons of the year, talking about the four kingdoms, the animal, the mineral, vegetable, spirit. So some say that these four judgments uh, are those that speak of God's judgment. It's interesting when we get to the last three, it's talking about humanity. And that's the reason I got that opening scene, because in these first four trumpet judgments, terra firma of the earth, really. Not that man's not affected by that. You know, whether he's on the motorcycle or standing on the beach with his dog. But these first short court judgment, the number four is reflected as he's pounding and shaking the earth. Remember Isaiah 13? So, what do I have on this? The first four trumpet judgments you know, bring devastation to God's creation. The last three trumpet judgments recorded in chapter 9 are directed at humanity, even though they're affected by this. And so this evening, we're going to limit ourselves. Now, as we begin to examine these first four trumpet judgments, 
There's really nothing to indicate that we should interpret them in any other way than in the literal sense. These seven trumpet judgments, in many ways, and I think it's interesting, I'm not taking a lot of time to do that, mirrors the ten plagues in Egypt. Okay, let's be consistent. If we're going to spiritualize these judgments here, then we have to take those judgments in Egypt less than literal. Are y'all with me? Because we see a lot of parallels here. And we've got to understand that. So the first trumpet sounds. Oh, we're there. It's not going to take long at all. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail, fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. Now, this sometimes I call these judgments the judgments of thirds. I want you to look at all the thirds here. Third part of the trees were burned up. All green grass. Uh, was burnt up. So the sound of the first trumpet in heaven sends hell and fire upon the earth mingled with blood. Okay? And so this hell and fire results in the burning of uh, one third of the earth, I suppose. Uh, specifically trees, green grass are destroyed. And that would likely, don't you think, would include crops? Uh, barley, rice, wheat, corn. Imagine the famine, the consequences. We kind of saw that already with the uh, the horsemen of the apocalypse and and uh, the wars and all of those things, death and pestilence, and the the result of that. Just recently, we witnessed this devastating storm uh, in Wyoming, this hailstorm. Uh, John and Michelle Perry. I was talking to the Floyd this morning. They're out of their house to this day. They had 50, was it 50? 50 hailstones, Ryan Wiley, penetrate their house. It's like, God, all right. <laughs> or a bird, you know. No, that's good. And 50 went through the roofs and through the ceiling. They're, they're totally rebuilding that house. It's apocalyptic hailstorm right here in Wiley, Texas. The Bible tells us that uh, that seventh plague, uh, that fell upon Egypt. It rained hail mixed with fire. Okay. But this is not literal. Yeah. Oh, by the way, how about the twin cities? Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, let's all go right now to uh, Israel. Let's go down to, 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 to southern Judah. Let's go down past the Dead Sea. And let's look at that area that's, that's obviously charred as a result of God's judgment. God also ran fire on the hell of Sodom and Gomorrah, hell. There, there's no reason to believe that God cannot or will not do it again. Amen. And so the second trumpet sounds. I told you, we're pounding the earth. Verses 8 and 9. The second angel sounded. And, it, and as it were, as it were, so this is figurative, okay? This is as it were, or like, didn't say it was a great mountain burning with fire, but it looked like it was cast into the what? Sea. Third part. Here we go again. Came as blood. Third part. Verse 9. The creatures that were in the sea died. The third part of the ships were destroyed. And so, while well, the first trumpet judgment seems to pound the dry land, the land, it seems like the second focuses on the destruction at the sea. Wow. Something like a great burning mountain. Did you see that opening scene? Yeah. Well, they look at this great crater off the coast of the Yucatan. You know, we, we, with technology, we're not only looking into our bodies and the smallest cell and to the furthest reaches of heaven, we've got technology looking at the face of this earth. And, it, you know, it's like the earth had a bad case of acne, you know. But there's this crater that's 22 miles wide and deep, and, and they're, they're doing core drillings in that. And they're saying that, that when that thing hit there, whenever that was, <laughs> 
It's in a tidal wave in all that's even measured by geologists in Texas around the branches. And uh, can you imagine the impact that that is? I, there's a history here. I just want you to know this. This, this history. Uh, certainly this could be a, a, an asteroid. Asteroids are literally mountains hurling through space. Kind of the debris left over from, from the beginning. But there's a group of asteroids that vary in size from just a few miles across each to hundreds of miles in diameter called the Apollo group. And they're in orbits. They're in an orbit that's in close proximity to the Earth. More asteroids are discovered every year. They have names for some of them. Uh, uh, Keres is 620 miles in diameter. These are asteroids. Pallas, 332 miles in diameter. Uh, Vesta, 240 miles in diameter. And so this huge burning rock enters comes crashing into the, the atmosphere, hits the sea, and it transforms one-third of the water into blood. One-third of sea life dies. One-third of the ships are destroyed. You know, just think about, you know, either those ships that are a direct hit or near there, or those with the, the think about the tidal wave, the tsunami that, that results from that that just swallows up vessels. <laughs> Evidently, sea life is killed, changing the water. Ships are destroyed by this, what's called this huge, it was like a mountain, John says. You know, this is the message that God sent John and signified or with signs. And so symbols and imagery of a big mountain, burning mountain, coming down and hitting the sea. Third trumpet sounds. Verses 10 to 11. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part, here we go, of the rivers, and the waters, the fountain of waters. And the name of the star was called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the water that were made. I think that's Cat Daniel Springs. <laughs> Have you ever been to Cat Daniel Springs? Praise God, that's in the past. That is out near Louisiana where we used to go to camp, and that is a mineral-drenched soil. And honestly, you had to hold your nose uh, to drink that water. It's so laden with sulfur, and honestly, as a kid, I was so hungry. I just, I'm so thirsty. I would just drink it in. That was before we had bottled water. Uh, the star. Some say, well, that's you know, that's uh, symbolic. They didn't say like a star. Well, stars can be uh, pictured as messengers. This is an angel, or maybe Satan himself. Well, he's going to show up later. It's called wormwood. It's a type of wood that, a wood that grows in the Middle East. It's, it's known for its bitterness. And evidently, it will affect the water as it impacts, either as a pollutant or by its impact, contaminates the fresh water supply. So, I mean, we're hitting the earth, we're hitting the sea, and then now we've got the water supply. Uh, unfit for human consumption. Fourth trumpet sounds, verse 12. Here we are. We're almost there. The fourth angel sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten. A third part of the moon. Y'all remember Isaiah chapter 15? Yeah. Huh? <coughs> you, you remember anything said about the constellations? Yeah. You remember anything said in Isaiah 13 about shaking the heavens? And the earth. Third part of the stars. So the third part of the dark part of the darkened <laughs> imagery. The Bible agrees with itself. Isaiah 13. 
Day shall not for a third part of it, and night likewise. The fourth judgment is aimed at celestial bodies, such as the sun, the moon, and the stars. And the light of the sun and the moon and the stars will be diminished by one third. It's interesting because you know, we had our blood moon not long ago, and it's just one of those times where it shows up. And it's just by, you know, it just. But though this is the blood room that they try to connect it with joy and stuff, but you know, don't, don't do that to me because you can't have that red blood moon without having the sun oblate. Oh, oh no, that was, that, was just, that was just a phenomenon on the earth. Uh, makes good copy and sells books. Yeah. Makes interesting circles. People like that. Too. Give them what they want. <laughs> Sorry if I stepped on your toes. <laughs> Israel's, everything's fine. We, we live through it. I'm still here. Are you here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. The daylight hours reduced. The light of the sun, moon, and the celestial bodies. The eclipse. One third. Well, one third of the night. Charles Ryrie, who was an American Bible scholar, theologian, he says, he thinks of the, the, the day night cycle. In the beginning, you know, you were getting chapter one. You've got the day and the night. And uh, Jesus says, you know, we walk up, you know, while it is day. But the night comes. So, but that's going to be messed with. Because God's not just shaking this earth. He's shaking the heavens. It's interesting, you know, because uh, there was a time when we, you know, Calvin, all of us, we... We, you know, we believed in a fixed earth, not a moving earth. Right? The earth was here, and the sun moved around the earth. Because the earth is the apple of God's eye, and the earth is fixed. And that's theology. And you disagree with me, I'll kill you. We got a problem, Houston. Because with the enlightenment, the microscope and the telescope, we begin to see things as they were. That word fixed. So we look at scripture differently in light of science. Yeah. Did I say that? <laughs> but, but, uh, Psalm 19, the heavens are telling. Romans 1 says, read both books. Yeah. Creation itself. I think God's the author of creation. Yeah. And I think he's the author of God's word. And I don't think they're at odds. Science is not always right. But, we don't believe in the big story anymore. Calvin did. Yeah. A lot of the others staked our lives on it. Yeah. But then came science. See, there was no other voice but you know, that voice back then. And then there's this philosophy, whatever they used to call it, and now we know it's not. I have, I'm born in 1953. I have never known a, a, a time when, when we haven't had the independent voice of science. Yeah. You understand? Separate from theologians. And they both overstep themselves and neither one of them trust themselves. But the earth is fixed. And this is where I'm finally getting to. The earth is fixed in that science has also revealed that this little orb called earth in our galaxy, there's not another orb like that. And it is God has just suited this earth for life. Genesis 1. Yeah. I mean, it's so fine-tuned it and fixed it yeah. that the poles of the earth, I mean, the, 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 the distance from the moon, I mean, set your criteria. It goes on and on and on and on. Well, I'll tell you what, God's tweaking it yeah. here. Jupiter runs ahead. I think it's Jupiter runs ahead of us. Jupiter that kind of runs interference. For all this garbage. What does God have to do for this to happen? Well, I don't believe that would ever happen. Well, I'll tell you what. The surface of the earth shows different. And God's word's true. Amen. All he has God to do is just, you know, God, if God has sent his, okay, let's talk about the boxes. We have the box of the cosmos. In the beginning, God created the what? The material world. So 
solar system. It's all of space. You've got to understand, God's outside the box. He established natural law. Let's, let's have an amen for natural law. You, you couldn't live on this place if there wasn't a, nat was a natural law. But I tell you what, God authored those laws, and God has the prerogative at any time to reach into the box and heal a blind man and cause the land to walk. Intervene in human history. And one day, shake this earth and shake the heavens. And all of those that are shaking their fists in the hand of the face of God. God's going to have the last word. And there's not going to be. Behold, He cometh in clouds, and every eye shall see Him. I think it's going to be the greatest I told you so in all of human history. Let's go to, to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to end here. Because we've gone to Isaiah. We've gone to, to uh, Revelation. I, want, I just want to celebrate the unity of God's Word. Here in Hebrews, there's an allusion. Allusion to the visitation of God's wrath upon the earth. And the establishment of His kingdom. I want you to know in just a few verses, that's exact. We've got revelation in just a few verses right here. Notice, are you there in, Re in, in uh, Hebrews 12, 26? Who, God, whose voice talked to me, shook the earth. Now that's past, you've got to go back. That's Mount Sinai. He talks about Mount Sinai and he talks about Mount Zion. And really it's a, the two covenants. But he goes back to that, that top with all the smoke and the hail and the lightning of Mount Sinai. The people were totally afraid. And they said, oh, Moses, you go and talk to God. For us, we'll stay down here. Notice, he shook the earth, but what? Now, now he has, I need to hear this. Promise. Okay. It, what about God's character? Is his or he is he immutable? Does he change? No. Does he keep his promises? Yet what? Once more. Okay. He's, once more I shake not the earth only, but also what? Heaven. We gotta remember yet. The God that we know and worship and reveal himself in his word is outside of time in this material world. You know, we look at a box. It's got you know height, width, depth. It's dimensional. It's a very limited thing. But I tell you what, God has more than one of those dimensions. Amen. Which, which we're, we're understanding. He's outside the box. He can, he can come in and, 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 and alter anything that He wants at any time. So our God is the God of the supernatural. Our God is the God of miracles. And the day is coming when God will intervene in the affairs of men in such a way that it will be undeniable. Churches are empty. Most churches on Sunday night are not even, they're, they're not, there's no one there. Christianity is on a downslide in America. I tell you what, God will shake the earth and the heavens just as He Verse 27 of Hebrews 12. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as the things that are made. And that those things which cannot be shaken. Wow. What's real? Huh? Yeah. What's important? What, what merits our life? Wherefore we're receiving a what? Kingdom. Kingdom. Which can not be moved. Wow. I want you to know that's revelation right there. Yeah. Revelation is, is, is God.
God finally settling the score. And this that he's allowed Satan for his own purposes. But I tell you what, time's going to be up one day. And God's going to kick the usurper out. Come on. I was raised, my dad had, I don't have, I don't have rent houses. Oh, your dad had rent houses. Why don't you have rent houses? Because my dad had rent houses. <laughs> and I was cheap labor. <laughs> and I wish I had a dime for every time he had to kick renters out. Because they wouldn't pay their bills. And they would, you know, get their oil out of their car, old oil, put it on the oven, turn it up, put rags in it, and smoke up the house. Because they were being kicked out. I never will forget that. And I had to get all that smut out the walls. I tell you what, Satan's going to be kicked out. So that God, and that's the book of Revelation. Because at the end of the, at the end of this seventh week of Daniel, God doing all this to, 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 to shake everything that can be shaken to establish his kingdom, which as an eternal kingdom, which cannot be shaken. Tell me, amen. Amen. So what's the application? Wherefore, verse 28, See in the kingdom we cannot be moved. Let us have what? Grace. Whereby we may what? Acceptably. With what? Grace and holy fear. And don't forget this. Because God does not change. Who is He? I need to hear from you. Consuming fire. And the phrase, let us have grace, it admonishes us to hold on to the grace, and our grace in light of God's coming judgment in the sinful world. And since we're part of an unshakable kingdom, we shouldn't be shaken. Okay, this is where we have we get too attached to stuff. We get we make a big deal out of stuff that is not a big deal, and families are divided over junk. And you know we we forget what's real. God help us to hold on and find grace to know what's important in this life. Tell you what, you've got cancer. You're going to die in three weeks. That brings clarity. Sure. Amen. i got three weeks to live. What am I going to do with those three weeks? This should bring clarity to us. And what is, what is going to be, what is important, and what will stand. It's on the basis of this grace that we worship God acceptably. And how do we worship God? With reverence. And God in fear. Yeah, interesting. We're ending tonight uh, like we began this morning, Psalm 33. He's called it, Fear of the Lord. Considering who He is and His character and His power, fear of the Lord. He is a consuming fire. Well, I don't worship a God that I have to fear. Well, I'll tell you all to. I, I feared my dad. I was a pretty good kid at home, really. I wasn't perfect, but I was a pretty good kid. Grace is no excuse to live our lives as we please. Our serve God suits us. Brother Josh at Firebank just a couple of weeks ago said, you know, we ought not to offer, it's a principle that comes out of life that they did, ought not to offer anything to God that does not cost us. Amen. Yeah, I tell you what, you've got a Christianity, and that's what we've got, milk toast Christianity in America. You've got a faith, you've got a religion, you've got a faith that does, demands nothing of you. Okay, look at your watch. In a matter of time, it will mean nothing to you. Amen. It will mean nothing to you. And we'll become lukewarm Christians. <coughs> I will see the chapter four. Our text passage in Revelation 8 reveals that our God is a devouring we should humble us and lead us to purify our lives. Every Bible doctrine has a practical import. And the eschatology, considering the kind of stuff that we've looked at tonight, ought to, ought to purify our hearts. should change the way we live. Come on. Amen. should motive, motivate us. And there's years ago when there was a great day coming. 
a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. Talking about the coming day of judgment. I know it, probably that reference was the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. And we ought to live every day in light of that. But I tell you what, looking at this, well, wait a minute, we won't be here. We're out of here in chapter 4. Let me ask you two questions. Are you ready for the judgment day? And do you know someone who isn't? Father in heaven, we just, uh, that we consider, be able to look into the future, not really knowing just how soon this might be. That people we rub shoulders with and elbows with today, who are lost, even Jewish people, find themselves in the book of the Revelation, the seventh week of Daniel, and left behind. And that should bother us. We shouldn't be like Hezekiah, who says, well, while those things are good and run smooth in my day. But Father, in light of what we begin to see here, in this time when you will call in all accounts, may it change the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at our lives, what's important, what's not, how we worship you, and yes, a lost world. And Lord, just do a work of grace in our hearts. Shake us, move us today to be more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand in this room.